carbon stars, splitting Sirius B, a wooden tripod or pier, and some sunspots on episode 327 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris, and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the night sky, and this podcast is for everybody else who likes going out under the stars. So first off, Shane, I should have asked you, did you get any observing in this week? Uh, no, uh, I guess I shouldn't say no. I, I did do just a little bit of visual observing of asterisms and constellations in the backyard a couple evenings, but no, no optical observing. How about yourself? Yeah, about the same actually out here in my cabin, getting things set up for the next five or six months to do some observing out here. It's full moon. We've been more or less clouded out, although I saw the moon rising last night. It was kind of neat, but, uh, other than that, I uh, couldn't really see it. It was just through the clouds kind of thing. So hasn't really been good observing conditions anyway. And with the full moon, it's a good time to take advantage and start getting prepped for the late spring, early summer season. So excited for that. Yeah, for sure. It's always a, it's always a nice time. We've had a few great listener emails. Chris K, who is a bit uh, under the weather. He sent us a bit of an email here and hopefully he's just putting his feet up and getting some relaxation in. So maybe I'll, I'll read his and then we'll just get going. Chris writes, I enjoyed Thursday's show. I have attached some files for you. So this would be in reference to our reference to the carbon star list. And that's the Astronomical League's carbon star list of 100 carbon stars. I completed this list and had so much fun doing it. I did most of it with my 72 millimeter refractor. A few of the observations were done with my six inch refractor mostly because my session wasn't for carbon stars that night. I think one or two needed the bigger aperture because I could not pull it out of the darkness with the 72 millimeter. I also have a list that I've started for red stars that is not limited to true carbon stars. The list currently has 10 stars, and I typically add them when I discover them during a hop to another object. Nine are in the M class of stars, and one is in the K class of stars. There's a bunch right in the field of the double cluster when it comes round again. Huh. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't known those, hadn't noticed those red stars as much in the double cluster. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely make a, a better note to look for that next time I'm in that area of the sky. Chris goes on to say, I have to make time to compare the RASC list, Sky and Telescope Pocket Sky Atlas list, and the Astronomical League list, and make one combined super list. I've provided a CSV as well as the Sky Safari list format should be easily imported, and also an Excel of the Astronomical League. Hope you enjoy them, Chris. Well, thanks, Chris. The Carbon Star list, that's gotten a lot of attention from the listeners, Shane. We've received a lot of emails on this. Yeah, we did, which is really nice. So it's something that I hadn't looked into an awful lot prior to that. Definitely got some really valuable feedback and direction. And so what we've decided to do is have Luca Venezuela on. He's going to come on and talk in June, probably end up being released towards the end of June about carbon stars. And he's gone through and done just as Chris was working on there and taken a look at those three lists, the RESC carbon star list the Pocket Sky Atlas list, and the Astronomical League list. And I think he paired them all down to ones you can see in pretty small aperture telescopes like Chris was working on. So I'm excited to hear that. He's got 150 combined carbon stars from those lists. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that, Shane. I, I, I think that's one I want to do because I feel like when the moon is up, that would be a really good project for somebody like me. For sure. Yeah. Just similar to double stars, you can observe these kind of any night doesn't really matter if there's a moon in the sky and and even some of some of the light pollution does not matter so it's nice to have projects like that that you can work on pretty much anytime you want do you want to take a read of Ryan's email so Ryan said last friday i listened to your episode with Howard Banich about observing with large scopes on a drive up to my in-laws cabin in northern lower michigan i personally have not had the pleasure to observe with any scopes larger than 16 inches and i've never owned one larger than 11. the interesting thing is that i'm also behind on my other media and when i arrived at the cabin which has Bortle two skies when clear i pulled out the may 2023 issue of sky and telescope to read 
As you probably know, Howard has a great article in that issue about observing NGC 4565 with his large scopes. That article gave me some challenge ideas about or for this object. When I next get my C nine and a quarter inch, my current largest scope out to a dark sky. The other back episode that caught my eye was a real old one. Episode 92, Listener Observations of Sirius B. And the reason why this one is interesting to me is that I have had several successful observations of Sirius B in the last two years, including earlier this year with my 92 millimeter refractor. In the winter of 2022, I observed it twice with a former 160 millimeter APO I owned. Those successful observations led me to try to see whether or not I could do it with my 92 millimeter astrophysics stowaway. Here's an excerpt from my observing log on March 19th that I previously posted on cloudy nights. I started with Rigel, which I wanted to use to gauge the seeing. Rigel is a split of 9.5 arc seconds compared to Sirius's roughly 11 arc seconds. I split it easily at 66 times, which told me that splitting Sirius might be in play. Of course, Rigel is an easier split because the primary is fainter than Sirius and the secondary is brighter. From Rigel, I moved up to M42. A good amount of detail in the nebula was visible, and the trapezium looked like pinpoints at 66 times. Trapezium E faded in and out, which is a first for me in any three and a half inch refractor. Even after two and a half years, the stowaway is still amazing. From there, I went to Sirius last year. I split Sirius for the first time using my CFF 160 refractor. That scope is gone, but I keep thinking that the split should be possible in much smaller telescopes. An 11 arc second split is normally not a challenge for a 92 millimeter scope. For example, Epsilon Lyrae is pretty easy at 2.3 arc seconds. But as everyone knows, the magnitude difference is key for Sirius. I threw as much magnification as I can muster at it, 245 times with the eyepieces that I own, and I am confident that I saw the pup during moments of good seeing. It was there, just barely peeking out from Sirius's airy disc, but over 10 to 15 minutes, I repeatedly saw and tracked it just northeast of Sirius itself when the seeing stabilized. The key to this observation was that Sirius was just past its highest point in the sky and it moved far enough to not be above my neighbor's roof. So thus you can achieve the split in a smaller scope, but you will need a good control of light scatter and exceptional seeing. Of course, for you guys, Sirius, Sirius's highest position in the sky is even lower than here in Michigan. So you will need to deal with the atmospheric scattering. I'm just about through all of the back episodes at this point, but I'm still finding older gems like the one above. I also want to mention that I have been a user of the Nexus digital setting circles on some of my mounts for the last three years, and it is a wonderful system, as I'm sure you will discover with additional use. It hasn't completely replaced paper in the field for me, but it is close. Keep up the good work. I'll try to send a few observing reports when I have some. It's been cloudy spring here so far, and aside from short lunar session last week, or I haven't been out in the last week or so, hopefully the period around May new moon will be clear so that I can get up to one of my dark sites before galaxy season ends. And that's from Ryan. So thanks, Ryan. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks for the words of support and for going back and listening to some of the older episodes and making good use of them. That's uh, really awesome. I sure would like to take, have taken a look through that CFF 160 millimeter refractor. That must have been quite a treasure. Yeah, yeah. I've read a little bit about CFF telescopes on cloudy nights. They sound like wonderful instruments, but I've never looked through one. I've never either. I, I feel like they're almost like the Ferrari of telescopes. It's not like a, I don't know how big a brand name it is, but I think they're pretty good instruments from all reports. Yeah, I can't remember if they use fluorite or not, or which glass they use, but the whole the whole telescope is, it just sounds like it's top notch. I think they're pretty expensive though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they certainly are not uh, inexpensive. <laughs> so Donnie sent us this, this email on, these emails on telescope building. I feel like we've got to get a thread going somewhere in our blog or something. People that are building these tripods and different things. Just such incredible work. So Donnie built this amazing portable wooden pier and wrote us an email about it. He titled the email tripod versus quad pod. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Great email and great design. We'll get into it here. 
Donnie writes, Chris, nice work on the recent YouTube unboxing and book review. Well, thanks, Donnie. Appreciate you taking a look at those. And we had a few positive responses from that in our other videos. So I think we'll try to do the odd video from time to time, Shane. Although, as we just found out, when I'm at a different location like I am today, it kind of stresses the system a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So we'll give it a we'll give it a shot when we can. Donnie writes, Shane, I asked you in a previous email if you thought a 20 pound Explore Science 127 millimeter refractor would be too much for the Stellarview M2C mount and pure extension. You said you thought it would. So I had to try it. I have an aluminum tripod with the legs filled with caulk and sand, and that is very heavy. I use this tripod for my test results. Just the slightest touch to the OTA or the focuser resulted in vibrations in the field of view that took around 10 seconds to settle out. This will definitely not work. But I love the M2C with the encoders and iPad and wanted to find a way that it would work somehow. I decided I would build a tripod. I did some research on various designs that would lessen vibrations and found that a four-legged design would dampen vibrations quicker than a three-legged design. But the four-legged design would be harder to level. I did some drawings and determined I could solve the leveling problem by putting levelers on each leg. I built a prototype with plans to add turnbuckles from the center pier to each of the four legs. But upon testing it without the turnbuckles, I found they were not needed at all. The mount is very firm with no vibration. Settled time when moving the scope or focusing is less than one second. I am super pleased with the results. The wood is fir and pine bolted together with 10 inch by half inch bolts to allow for disassembly when storing. The shelf is held. He has this beautiful shelf, but halfway down, and it's held in place with 5 16 inch hand knob bolt. The M2C screws onto the top of the pier into a 3 inch hanger bolt that is screwed six inches down in the wooden pier pole. It takes about 10 minutes to set up, including mounting the scope. See photos below. Thanks, guys, for the great job you both are doing with the podcast, Clear Skies. Donnie, thanks so much for that, Donnie. Yeah, I love this. Like, I love the mount, the M2C mount. We, Donnie and I have the same one, and we also have the setting circles. So mm -hmm. a lot of similarities there. But like I said to him, I didn't think it could handle the 127, but I'm glad he did this experiment because it really proves out how robust the mount is and also how important uh, your tripod is. And having this four-legged sort of pier concept is is really amazing. And what I love about it too is that the parts to build it, if somebody wanted to build something like this, are very easily purchased mm -hmm. at a local hardware store. It's basically just some wooden bolts. It doesn't require specialized tools or anything like that. Like this is a very accessible tripod. Uh, if you, I guess it's not really a tripod, but a <laughs> four-legged pod, pure uh, mount, and it's also portable. So I love it. Yeah, the way the way it appears, and I actually think I have all the parts to build one of these under my deck because they're the same parts that were. Uh, that my builder used to build my deck last year or fix my deck last year, I should say, put a railing on it, is just a four by four inch post. And I think, I'm not sure how long it is, looks like it's about three and a half or four feet long. And then on the bottom, he just has basically four boards that are that are bolted onto each of the four sides. And so it just kind of makes a big plus sign on the bottom where the four by four post is the center of the plus sign hub. And then at the end of each of those four boards is the levelers. Looks like a fairly simple design. I really like it. It's pretty elegant looking. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I just think it's great. Uh, at some point I may, I may build myself one. I'm not sure. Yeah. And then like you and I were even talking that uh, could be a solution for maybe extra peers out here and that sort of thing could be fun. I like the tray that he's installed too. Although I think if I was doing a tray, I might do a smaller one just for my own personal preference, but that's a pretty neat addition as well. Yeah. The tray is super handy for your extra eye pieces and, you know, sky Atlas and whatever else you might have, uh, you know, sketching tools, that sort of stuff. Very handy to have that. Thanks so much, Donnie. Appreciate you taking the time to take some photos and sending those along. I love seeing what people build out there. I know Leonid had sent us ones of his tripod Stuff like that, like this custom stuff that you just can't find built somewhere. There's just something to it, Shane. Personally, I actually use a custom built tripod that my friend Rudolph Dorner had made. 
and gifted to me. And it's just such a wonderful tripod. And I always love using it with one of my refractors when I'm doing public observing and a child comes up and accidentally trips over one of the legs a little bit. And it's totally stable. It's never caused the telescope hardly to shake at all even. And the parent will be, oh my goodness, sorry about that. You know, and and almost like starting to scold the child. I'm like, no, don't worry about it. These are just broom handles. You know, he had built it with broom handles. And I said, if he broke it, I can just go to the hardware store and buy a new broom handle. And the parent is always like, oh, and so much relieved. You know, it works well. It functions, uh, it, it performs the function you need, which is great. Phil from the UK sent us, I love these sketches that he sent us, Shane. These, I just like the aesthetic of it. It's like mm-hmm. almost on, looks like old timey parchment paper or something. I don't know if that's the color of the paper or whether he's just added this color to it afterwards or what, but they just look fantastic. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And, and he's been sketching a lot of activity on the sun in white light, uh, and, and capturing a lot of detail, not just within the larger sunspots, but like the little dark remnants kind of in between them. And I love that level of detail. Uh, it just highlights how much there is to see on the sun, even in white light. Yeah. He's using an 80 millimeter F5 with a Lacerda wedge and a batter continuum polarizer. I feel like that is probably one of the most expensive setups. Somebody has hung off a ST80 they bought uh, used on a auction site. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. The interesting thing too. So Phil, you know, exchanges a number of communications with us and prior to the uh, Lacerda wedge, he was using the Bader uh, solar film. And Mm -hmm. when he got the wedge, uh, I remember one of the emails he sent was just how much better the wedge was in terms of Mm -hmm. revealing finer detail on the sun. And uh, certainly I've experienced that too, when I switched to a wedge and, and I wasn't sure because you read about these comparisons on cloudy nights or other forums. And sometimes the level of difference between gear is somewhat subjective. So I'm, I'm always cautious when I read about how how much better one thing is versus the next. But when it comes to wedges versus film, I'm a believer in that one. I, I think that there's a lot of truth to the uh, the wedge quality. He sent us a couple sketches here. And I really, uh, Phil is a tremendous sketcher. Mm-hmm. He really is. Yep. And I, he did this active region 13282. And I think the one on the left is from the 19th of April. The one on the right is from the 18th, I guess. So they're, they're a bit reversed. But it just shows the the evolution of some of these sunspots and what what changes you can observe over the course of a day. This is fantastic work, I think. Agreed. Yeah, super, super cool. Thanks so much for sending that, Phil. My apologies. I am having trouble getting images from you all of a sudden. We've communicated for years. And Shane, I don't know if this is happening to you as well, but everybody else's photos and images and that are coming through fine. But when Phil sends them to me, they're like embedded in the email somehow. And I, I I have a lot of trouble pulling them out. So anyway, my apologies. Well, that's it. This is just a short episode. We're taking a bit of a break here towards the middle of May. Do you have anything to add to this episode, chain? No, that's it, Chris. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe and do us the favor of sharing the show with other stargazers you know. And you can always reach us at actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.